Welcome to um, everyone here, to the audience and to all the lovely people I'm going to talk to. Before we start, my name is Miranda Sawyer and we are here to talk about um, Rockfield, the studio on a farm, the fantastic documentary that it was shown on BBC on the 18th of July and is still on iPlayer. Uh, for five more days. Before we start, just to say that this is a Q&A, so you can ask questions yourselves. Um, just type them into the Q&A um, format and I'll have a look at them. We've got half an hour of me asking questions and then 15 minutes of questions from you, the audience. Um, I'm going to do a little introduction because I think it's polite. Here we go. Um, so, Rockfield the Studio on a Farm. Um, this tells the story of Rockfield, the world's first ever residential recording studio, which is situated just outside Monmouth in Wales. Rockfield was started by two brother farmers, essentially Kingsley and Charles Ward in the early 60s. And it seems so many musicians pass through its, what we could call its barn doors, um, that it's kind of ridiculous to list them. There's Black Sabbath, David Cassidy, Iggy Pop, Robert Plant, Simple Minds, Adam and the Ants. Queen, The Stone Roses, Oasis, Manic Street Preachers, The Charlatans and Coldplay. And many of these artists appeared in this wonderful documentary. So I am going to introduce everybody here involved. So I'm very happy to introduce um, Hannah Berryman, who directed. Give us a wave, Hannah. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, producer, Katrin Ramsut. Hello. Waving. Um, editor, Rupert Hausman. Hello, Rupert. Hi, hi. And um, legendary re recording producer and Stone Roses waiter borer, John Leckie. <laughs> I have sympathy, John. I have waited for the Stone Roses myself. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, shall we get started? I'm going to start with you, Hannah, because you are the director. And um, I just, I suppose I just wanted to know uh, where the idea came from this. Because once I, I saw this documentary was, you know, on the iPlayer, I thought, of course, of course. Why has nobody made this before? What a great subject. Mm. Yeah, that's what I thought. So basically I watched, I think it's about five years ago, I, I watched Muscle Shoals and I was thinking, where's the British Muscle Shoals in a way? Where's the sort of unusual studio story that, um, and so I was looking at which studios there were and which being done and came across Rockfield. And I had heard of Rockfield, but I didn't really know how many people had been there. So I called them up, I couldn't find any doc about them. Uh, and I went down to see them and I just thought, this is brilliant and bonkers. And Anne started telling me about how the Oasis were too noisy and they'd had to tell them to turn the noise down. And I just thought, there's not many studios that have had those artists, but have this family who were a farming family. So I thought, okay, this is brilliant. And put it to um, initially Kate Townsend, who was a story film. She gave me a very small development. And I ended up being put in touch with Film Wales. And that's how I met Kat. And she had a brilliant music background of music films. And I thought we'd be a really good partnership for it, which it turned out we were. <laughs> okay. Um, Kat, to bring you in, I mean, when you think about a, a documentary like this, as a producer, obviously you think, oh, great idea. But also I know producers think, hmm, where are the problems? Did you kind of imagine any of the problems uh, in this, uh, making a documentary like this? Could you foresee any? You've got to unmute, you're muted. Hey, uh, rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. Like, musicians. <laughs> My partner's a musician. And it's like, it, it, Hannah came across the story and, and got the access to the family, but it's not like this film hadn't been, people hadn't tried to make this film before, but A, you needed the family to be completely on board. And then you need to know how to maneuver the music industry and how to get people on board. Just, you know, it was, it was just like, oh yeah. Yeah, it's a great idea, of course, but all those musicians and licensing all that music for the people out there who uh, work in TV and film, it was just like, oh gosh, and how are we gonna do that? That is actually interesting because the very first question that I've got from a member of the audience right here, Alan Boyd, it says, could you talk about how you approach the music in clearance? Did you just go for it and clear afterwards? <laughs> Did you just think I'll oh, just clear it later? Um, well, we had a, a very long list, didn't we, Hannah? We discussed who had the biggest hits, basically. Who, you know, who were the who, which musicians, which artists had the biggest hits, and and ha and Hannah was the one who kind of kind of filtered it down. You can take over from there, Hannah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, in, I mean, you know, it, it's sort of like people have to want to watch. I wanted it to be a film that everyone would come to. And so we had, we kind of narrowed it down to there were kind of three or four really big people that we knew we had to get at least most of. And we also need to get the funding. So all in all, it, and Kat did most of that getting of the people. Um, I think I called John, but lots of the kind of big like Liam and Coldplay and Ozzy was Kat. And that um, that took a long time. You know, it's like the funding and the artists in place. And, you know, nobody should make a film like this and think it's going to be easy. But what was great is Kat just helped persevere with it. <laughs> we just were getting bits of funding. We did the Coldplay interview back in 2016. Ah, that is interesting because when I was watching the um, the documentary, I did think the Coldplay uh, interview seemed very different to the to yeah. the other interviews. It seemed was it done somewhere else? Was it done like in America or? It was in Chicago, and we kind of didn't really know whether we definitely had Chris till the last minute. So it is it was a you know this was a seat of your pants type of film to make. People look at it and they say, God, it must have been such a laugh making it. And it <laughs> was a laugh making it, but it was also hard to make it you know and to get it together and you had to kind of keep your um I don't know you had to not lose faith that it was all going to work out <laughs> yeah okay how long in the end did it take five years yeah from years. from the time that Hannah bought me the idea um and then we agreed to work together and then we started raising financing Film Cymru Wales gave us development funding to get you know, a taster together essentially so that we could raise the, the rest of the production funding. But I have to say it's testament to the Ward family, all these bands, you know, as you can feel throughout the film, the, they wanted to do it for them. Yeah. Uh, and they didn't want to do it for me, you know, who am I? I'm just a producer. They, everyone had always said that, you know, Rockfield's such a great story, why hasn't it been told? And Ozzy had said that to uh, Kingsley, and so I was like, well, Kingsley, really, you're the one who needs to ask him if he could be in this film, not me. It's got to come from you because Sharon's just going to say, what, who, her? No, but like Kingsley persuaded, was the one who persuaded Ozzy to participate. We did little videos, didn't we, of Kingsley. We were like, take two, take three, take four. <laughs> that we could send, you know. Um, but I mean, obviously... I don't know, carry on anyway, what you want to ask, because... Okay, well, I want to, I'm going to um, bring in um, uh, Rupert, because I wanted to ask a bit about editing, because editing, um, I know, comes in um, later in a, in a production, but I'm always interested what editors think, because you come in and you're given the, you know, the, 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 uh, the footage, and one of the things that I really loved about this um, documentary is a sense of emotion in it there's a lot of sorrow in it um there's a lot of um in hilarity uh in, there's a lot of emotion in it which um obviously as an editor you 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 would have felt that as soon as you saw the footage i imagine yeah i mean it was a real it was a joy actually to watch the stuff because i think you know there's a lot of love uh for the place and i i think you know and hannah did an amazing job with interviewing the contributors I, you know all of them gave so much of themselves and i think you know as kat says i think this is partly testament to the fact that they've got a sort of very deep seated connection with the place and it's a story that hasn't really been told and so much stuff has happened there you know i mean i think you know the idea of being able to sort of do a complete uh, front to back story of rockfield is a joke i don't, I don't think you can do it there's too many stories frankly mm -hmm. I mean, you, could, you could just keep rolling there for a year and and uh, you know keep keep coming out with anecdotes you wouldn't get them all but there was um but i think that, that what we you know what we got in the cutting room uh was was so beautifully varied you know in terms of uh, you know the highs and lows and and actually the, the stage setting of this is the ward family and kingsley you know and 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 you know, he sets such an interesting tone for, 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 for the film in, in and of himself. And, that, and there's such a joy to begin there. And then when you know you've got these sort of great passages uh, that come, that, that follow it, that, that have this incredible depth, you know, which is not, which is actually what's extraordinary about this film as opposed to other music docs. You don't often get that level of heart in music docs often. You know, you get really brilliant, you know, very compelling music documentaries but to have such a variety of emotions is unusual I think to have something yeah. so funny and moving 
is yeah. kind of rare. I think you know there I, there are some uh, that that I know and love, but um, but I think it's a really interesting. It was a really interesting thing to be part of because you know to try and wedge all of that stuff into one you know 90 minute shape is uh you know is a bit of a challenge you know and i you know and actually i think you know what was what was brilliant was that you know hannah had lived with it for so long to the point when by the time she came to me with the film she really had a lot of it very much or, or, or very much what she wanted these people to say very much in her head and actually there was something sort of brilliant about that because it was uh you know it was just then a question of sort of making it really sit up you know as a, as a work. piece of work yeah yeah, yeah. But actually, okay. Lucas underplaying his role there because he's obviously we're both from very much doc backgrounds, and so that combination for me of humour and emotion is what I like, and I think it's what Rupert likes too. And he does a lot of kind of dark Navy documentaries, and it was a chance for him to bring the fun out that he's good at. So he clocked how could we make this sing, both in both ways. It's all the little ways you see the editing. It's very clever, and that was all Rupert. So. I think we share those two sensibilities. We like that yeah. mixture and yeah. thank God yeah. that was in the material and that was in the story of Rockfield, you know. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to yeah. come back that, to that in a minute, but I'm going to bring uh, John in. So, John, as a man who has been to Rockfield and waited for a long time for the roses there and, um, uh, and made uh, records with simple minds, um, I suppose what I'd really like to, to ask you, as someone who's worked there, um, I know that before you worked there, you, you, I mean, you worked at Abbey Road, which is mentioned in the documentary by, by Jim Kerr as a place as, uh, that was, he thought was posh and quite <laughs> highfalutin. And it, there is still an element of Abbey Road that can be a bit like that, I think. And so to come from there into Rockfield, which, and I'm going to quote you here, you say, um, it's a bit rough, we can do anything here. <laughs> That's what you said about it. Yeah. I'd just like to know, I mean, can you explain what that kind of magic of Rockfield was for you, the difference um, between it? it and it's, it's like I say, you can do anything there. I mean, very much, I think what you, when you were saying you, how you found, you know, Kingsley and the family and the kind of love there and, and everyone that's been there has had an experience. And that's kind of, I, I was going to say, that's what they're selling. They're selling a residential uh, place where all your needs are provided, whether it's food, you know, washing, cleaning, anything you need to do is provided. All you have to do is play the music, you know, sing the song and, and, and make the recording, you know. So everyone that's attached to it has... Uh, uh, sees it as a family, you know, <laughs> as, as um, Kingsley and, and uh, Anne there and everyone, you know, because you've spent many weeks there, you know, weekends, weeks, months there, and all your needs have been looked after. It's very much like a family thing. So, um, uh, yeah, the residential studios, you know, and, and, and that's the service they provide. And, and it's very specialised. I mean, could you imagine having, you know, four, six raving people who were desperate to, with huge egos, who made a mess everywhere, every day made a total like trash the every room in the place, and day in day out you had to provide for them and keep them you know keep them going because you, otherwise the music stops. If there's a problem, you know if the, if the hot water isn't working, from there's no record, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and how is it as a person you know who's producing a record? Because if you're in that residential situation, which is incredibly intense you know obviously um that's part it's, of the it joy isn't, of it. it isn't actually it's no it's no more it's less intense than having to drive through london to get to abbey road or getting the train up and then sorting a taxi home and but you know and all that stuff and then when you get home there's that stuff happening and this kind when you're there you're you're on another planet really <laughs> you know all that's kind of cut off you never i mean i'm you know i'm not a big phone person but when i'm there i don't i don't see, see or speak to anyone other than the people in the studio and that's how focused it can become. And I think anyone that works in residential studios, musicians that create and record, that's the, that's the whole reason for going there. And that's why some bands you can't take there. You'll never take them. You know, you may take them residential to another studio like Real World Studios, Peter Gabriel Studio, a bit posher, a bit more, you know. Bit can more... we unpick this? What, what, <laughs> which bands, what, what kind of bands suit Rockfield then? Which bands would you not take? Would I not take? Yeah, you just said a certain band you can't take to Rockfield. What kind of band? You, know, you can name <laughs> names or you can just what say the, the ones that haven't been there. You could say Radiohead haven't been there. 
Um, you all Too live in the place, they like their <laughs> comfort and things. Um, you know, people, on the other hand, I worked with a guy called Novastar, a, a, a singer songwriter from Belgium, and he wanted to record with musicians. And I took him on a little tour of London, and then we went to Real World and other couple of studios in Bath. As soon as we got to Rockford, this is it. This is where I want to make the record. You just felt that, you know, there was no, there was nothing putting him off. You know, there wasn't like expensive antiques or crazy furniture or, <laughs> you know, everything was super clean, you know, like you, you know, Rockfield, it's, it's funny, like you, you spill your beer on the carpet and you, you know, you mop it up kind of thing, but you don't worry so much about it if you spilt your beer on Peter Gabriel's carpet, for instance. You know, okay. I'll say that in mind if I ever want to make a record. Feel, some bands feel <laughs> that's a restriction, you know. Yes, I can understand that. Hannah, I wanted to ask you a bit, are you talking about get, getting the whole documentary together? Yeah. But the fundamental part at the beginning, which I think we're all agreed on, is um, having these uh, great interviews with Kingsley and Charles. They are very particular people, aren't they? They're very mm. unusual. Um, yeah. And um, I suppose I wondered uh, how long it took you to take those, uh, to, make, to get those interviews. And did you start with them before you got everybody else? I mean, you said you got Coldplay, but then did you really work on Kingsley and Charles? Not really, no. I mean, we, we, were, we just became friends with them, to be honest. We're friends with the family. I'm, you know, I would speak to Lisa all through, uh, yeah. particularly. And so by the time we came up at the end of 2018, I think it was, to do their interviews, we'd already done filming there with Robert Plant. We'd already got to know them really well and kept them in the loop of what was going on. So it was more like, okay, now we'll do the interviews. So I just had to find the right setup. And Kingsley's was like, well, obviously the piano was this massive speakers either side, which completely nuts and very Kingsley. So that was where we did Kingsley's interview. Charles, we didn't have to do a thing. That was his living room. It was literally like a film set. You know, yeah. it probably took like 40 minutes to set up the interview. And it was probably my favorite setup of any interview I've ever done. Uh, yeah, and then we just talked to them and actually Kingsley, he was, he was good. I mean, it's hard on his tour. I was doing that tour with him and I was sort of thinking, I don't know what I, how I can use this. And in the end, I quickly realized like, just let him do the tour however he wants and that will be what it is. And that's what we did yeah. and Rupert used it really well. And so it sort of had its own, sometimes when you're making a dot, you sort of follow how people are being. You can't really know too much of how you're gonna be able to use it. <laughs> yes, you have to, yeah, it breathes its own life. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this, the sorrow element because there's obviously the sorrow element which is around the charlatans because of Rob being killed, which is absolutely terrible. But there's also a sense of sorrow, I feel, a little bit around um, Martin Carr from the Boo Radleys and you cut yeah. very carefully between yeah. um, those moments. So mm. I suppose I wanted to talk to you and Rupert around that because there is a sense, I think Martin's a wonderful person, um, but there is a sense that he has of feeling that those were excellent days that have passed or something around that? Mm. I mean, Rupert can say how what he made of it when he saw it. For me, it was key, um, always the charlatan story. Uh, you know, it's a place where everything has happened, good and bad. Mm. And I love the way they talk about it in the film and the redemption they find in, you know, giving Rob his place, you know, in the film is fantastic. With Martin, I didn't know what, I didn't know really much about Martin. And he just, you know, he obviously had a very mixed experience there. And I thought, well, that's the key to Rockfield. It's just a place and it can be, as much as it's this expanse of a place that can be amazing, that can probably feel very lonely and bleak when things aren't working with you and your bandmates. Yeah. And John and Rupert will have more to say on that, but we wanted to get that it could be both in, because that's the jeopardy. Yeah. You go in a place like that, How's it going to pan out? And part of that is how's it going to pan out between the relationships with the band? Very much so. Did you have a sense of that then, Rupert? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, Martin. I, I love Martin. I think it was, he, he was so surprising because the music he was writing at the time was so sort of joyous. And the first thing I think he said in the interview was how much he liked it because it was like a lament. And it was like, no, oh, it's like, like you just liked it because it's full of minor chords. <laughs> It was like, oh, okay, I get you. You know, it's like, it's sort of, you know, it's a sort of trap soul writing pop um, and, and doing very yeah. well at it at the time. And I think, you know, I think he was a great 
example of of that idea of family you know in that you know you're sort of stuck with these people actually you know and i think sometimes it's sort of amazing and brilliant and it, it leads to interesting really you know inspired events and sometimes it's like christmas uh in the worst way and i think for him it <laughs> ended up he got both ends of that um but you're sort of le left with it because it's sort of recorded you know that your experience there is documented in a way that you know christmas isn't thank god um you know but uh, but i think so so so, so he has sort of it's sort of in embedded in his memory and also as you say that you know he, he he went you know he's still he's still very much producing which is great you know making making music and enjoying that but he's not making you know big hits like he used to and that's fine you know mm. um so so there's a sort of te there's, there's there's a sort of essence that he is you know he, he'll always be measured by that and i i, th I think that there's there's a sadness maybe in that um you know and, and in terms of the, the, the charlatans, the idea of legacy is what the charlatans is all about. That sense of, you know, that the, they they made some amazing things there. And, and actually what I loved about that story was actually there was sort of, there was sort of, even in the Devon's devastation, there was a sort of joy about their experience and about the fact that even the wor even when the worst happens, the memories were so strong and so good that, that there's a sort of joy about the memories. It's not just sad. And I think that's what makes it quite emotional because it feels so layered uh, in a way that only sort of family gives you. That sort of, it has a depth and a gravity to it that is, yeah. uh, that, that, that actually comes from that shared experience. And and I think that's, and, and as you say, I think that's, that speaks to both in a weird way, Martin's experience and theirs, and probably all of their experiences actually in that place. Yeah, I think that's true. John, I'm going to bring you in again because I'm going to ask you about the Stone Roses and um, that the, you worked on um, a couple of tracks with them there. Um, and uh, I suppose what I wanted to ask is, you know, that notoriously the second coming, their second album was made at Rockfield and it took them months and months and months and months. You worked on One Love, I Am The Resurrection, which was kind of just before, but you also worked on a few of the tracks as well on the, sec on the second before coming. That's right. Before before we actually got to Rockfield, we'd worked 126 days, I think, in the studio in various places in Manchester in a house. We had the Rolling Stones mobile. We worked for two six week periods with the Rolling Stones mobile parked in a house with catering and programming and engineering and the Rolling Stones mobile. <laughs> and so we'd already done 12 weeks doing that. And then we went to a studio in Bury that was going cheap and they booked it for a year to rehearse. And, um, and I went down there for six weeks and, uh, and then they said they really wanted to go to Rockfield and get it together. And they booked six weeks at Rockfield and I turned up on the first day and we, had discussions and then I left <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was incredible relief. I mean, it was incredible weight off my shoulders after probably three years and being tied, you know, and this feeling of doing well, days and weeks of work and nothing being, what could you say? Uh, what could I say? Approved <laughs> or nothing good, being good enough. Let's not say it's not, you know, every, some of those things were good enough, but, approved to move forward to 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 fit, complete the record you know i mean yeah. anyone can make about make an album in 12 weeks for god's sake you know let alone 12 months yeah yeah okay um hannah i want to talk a little bit about the fact that the stone roses didn't appear because you do acknowledge that in the in the um in the documentary rather gracefully i i felt <laughs> in, with a nice sofa where they're not there yeah. And, um, uh, I suppose, I suppose, like how you, how is it when you've got a documentary where you would like somebody like the Stone Roses to appear? How disappointing is it if they don't, and how can you work around it? Yeah, I mean, all docs, you know, they're not. You never have everyone, and it's whether you can make the film work in that way. I might just be saying this, but I feel like it worked that they weren't there because that's their characters, like maintain the legend, you know? And and like, you know, we got all these bits of archive, like the bits where they're talking, that classic interview with the, yeah. when they're young. And I just think they're so brilliant in there, their character, they're so funny and cheeky and you absolutely get them. And I'm not sure, I would say this now, I'm not sure, you know, there was a bit of arming and ring, particularly with one band member, they were gonna do it, then they weren't, the, the management were always really helpful. Um, 
And in the end, they didn't. And I think it doesn't matter. And we were in the edit and I just said to Rupert, how about that line? And he's like, yeah, great. (laughs) So it's sort of like, maybe it wouldn't have worked with every band, but considering their story with John and what you'd heard, the fact that you then don't see them sort of seemed to make sense. So you can sometimes make something in docs of access that you don't fully get as well as the stuff you do get. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's very interesting. There's another point, which is almost the flip side of that, really, which is um, the Liam Gallagher interview. Yeah. So uh, uh, Liam, I've interviewed Liam. You know, we all know what Liam is. He was born like Liam. He will die Liam. He is absolutely consistent character. But he is um, naturally, I think, incredibly dominant. And somebody like that, to have in a film like you're making, it's quite hard to um, know when to put him in and and pull him out, I imagine. How did you um, manage it? I think Rupert might say that I was trying to use too much of Liam. (laughs) (laughs) Because I thought he was really good. I thought, even though I've seen him lots of interviews, he gave a really good quality of interview. And you could tell everything that happened with them as brothers in that bit of interviewing as well and I thought he was really insightful actually about the experience and about what Rockfield's about so um, Rupert can probably say more about how you you know sometimes as a director you need the editor to pull you out of it a bit and and stop you just over this is very it. interesting I have to say because I have another audience question which I'm just going to throw to you which uh, uh, this is from Christine Cowan and it says um, did the director and editor agree on the story from beginning to end how were differences managed so here we go, Rupert. Like, so, uh, what was your opinion on the on the on the Liam factor? <laughs> okay, I, just on that last point, I would say that when you're working with a director that's taken five years to make a film, it's her film. Okay, yeah. so that's how it was managed. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, you know, uh, with with often great tact. Uh, you know, I think Liam. Liam's a really interesting case in point because I love the interview with Liam. I could have, I could have just screened that from front to back. I, mm. And actually, you hear him often on radio or, you know, in print as he is, but not really on telly. I mean, you don't really see him like that or in film rather. You don't see him represented in that way often, you know, because often he, it doesn't, so he doesn't fit editorial lines at all. He's often discursive, moves around a lot, you know. And, yeah. um, and so what was sort of amazing about it is because he had bonehead there and he was musing about this experience and I think right at the beginning of the film he says I can't remember a thing you know and 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 that's so him you know and so it was really lovely to have to have that kind of energy in the film um and and so we wanted to to sort of use that obviously the the, the problem is then you know if you follow that to the nth degree you end up with an enormous pile of it mm. uh you know and uh, and then so to sort of you know to to make every contribution fight its corner is is the rigor you know and is the you know and you, you you hope that things don't sort of bag out in the middle and get a bit sort of slow um you know because you think oh, geez, i'm going back to liam again um you know <laughs> he's and always so I entertaining think though liam he never he never always, fails you is always entertaining, and uh, and I, I think he's my favourite appearance when he turns up with the, with the combine harvester. I, I just love that as a mm-hmm. sort of introduction to uh, to his experience there. But um, but yeah, so I think it, you know, I mean, we sort of chipped away. I think is the probably the best way to put uh, uh, at his contribution without because you couldn't we couldn't sort of chop him down. You end up having to sort of pick bits and go yeah. right. We're going to back this bit and back that bit and back that bit of the story, and then lose these chunks. Yeah. Uh, and as long as it felt sort of representative of his contribution, you know, in terms of the story of Rockfield, then that was fine, that, that one day, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this, uh, the, the other way, just to talk really quickly, sorry, uh, to Hannah and Rupert again, which is just about the, the, the little textures in the film. So there's some lovely photographs, there's obviously original footage as well, but there's little illustrations, there's... Um, uh, you know, so there's kind of, um, you know, uh, monitors being turned up to 11. There's lots of little graphics <laughs> in there. Um, and I wondered at what point you decided to use them, how you commissioned them. What was the what was the idea? I'm going to go to you, Hannah. For- yeah, um, I work with that team of illustrator and animator and have done for a few films. And um, so knew I wanted to work with them again and Rupert really liked it and there was a stage at which we were thinking actually of even having not reconstruction but some sort of filming like that and Rupert was like definitely not <laughs> so I'm really glad about that we didn't because what the animation brings I think that's different is that 
it's about a kind of flavor as well, you know, and you get that slightly quirky flavor that I guess we're trying to make this film and a lot of what I try to do is that. And I think animation gives you that. And, and of course it fills in the gaps where you haven't got the archive because, you know, I had a really good archive researchers, Ben yeah. and Lizzie and then Kat clearing away, but also this team of Andy and Sarah doing the illustration and animation, which, you know, isn't to everyone's taste, but people seem to have liked it. So I'm quite pleased. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there, uh, was there any bits that you just mentioned this a little bit, Rupert, about, um, you know, dropping bits of Liam? Were there bits that you dropped out that you think, oh, oh, I mean, I know you've got a perfect film, it's 90 minutes, you know it's really good, but there's always a bit, I know this from interviewing people, there's always a bit you think, mm, can't put it in. Or you, were you completely yeah. happy? Um, no, you're never completely happy. Uh, I think, you know, um, I always I always find watching back films that I've cut being a bit like this going, that's all right, is that okay? Um, actually, it's funny, there's, 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 there's actually a bit with uh, Liam's anecdote about Wonderwall when it's talking about the wall. I love the longer version of that. And, and actually Hannah was the one that told me to cut it down. And she was, I could have she actually lost the whole story, it. that one. She could have lost the whole story, sorry. But I, there was something about the joy in his face uh, at Bonehead buying a radio control car and driving it around, you know, just, just really annoying. Uh, no, no. no I, 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 loved, I loved all of that. I just thought that was just so funny. And it was so them as well. It's like it's a bunch of kids, you know, just pissing about and having a laugh, but also, creating the most amazing thing all at the same time and that's why, that's why i loved all of that stuff um but no i mean i think in terms of the animation stuff i mean you know that they, they were amazing and actually it, it really fitted because i think the whole thing about rockfield is a kind of handmade endeavor everything is kind of sort of handmade you know i mean it's all kind of that the whole the whole premise of the place is that it's sort of created through sort of love and sticky back plastic do you know what i mean and i think there's something sort of amazing about that and that's why the animations i think you know the the, the film before uh hannah did this one she had it in that and it, and it was so brilliant and sort of inspired and that you know the heads plonked on sort of sticky bodies and all of that sort of stuff and i thought there's just no it, it sort of is enough to sort of help you sort of fill in the gaps you know and, and just really enjoy enjoy it and uh yeah it was a real joy i i really look forward to andy delivering his his animations yeah, you know he's had once yeah. a week you know he'd turn up with them and they'll be like yeah, yeah that's what we got here you know, <laughs> what about you hannah was there a bit that you felt like you wanted to put in and you didn't didn't put in or did you get no. it all i just forget everything that didn't go in in the end it's all <laughs> I mean, and, and with the choices you know it's like of course, me and Kat, two women making this, that's probably important. It was a bit too ladsy for me, that story. And I like the ladsiness of it. And I like those guys being how they are. And I hope I was able to engage with them. You know, I've got lots of brothers and it was like natural for me. But equally, it's like you're always going to, there's a lot of material. So we were sort of choosing a slant. And I think it was like, it was funny, but it was also emotional, maybe as a film. And we wanted to sort of keep that. And so that's the sort of thing more you're doing with the choices. But it's weird. I never miss anything the minute it's gone. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just... You're hardcore. <laughs> you, just, it's, like, it's... you think you can't lose something and then you lose it and realise you absolutely can. Yeah, you're fine, yeah. I've got yeah. some questions here from the audience which I'd like to bring to you. Okay, so I'm going to give this to you, Kat. Um, this is from Erica James. Um, it's uh, a question was, do you think um, the UK film industry makes as much music-centred uh, films and documentaries as America? Um, if not... Why not? What do you think? Oof. I've never really done a comparison, but I mean, the USA is so much larger than us. They've got so many more bands, so many more stories. I, you know, even current music, I can't keep across. I'm sure there's a wealth of documentaries and stories out there to be told in America. We don't make, I don't know if we make that many here in the UK. To be frank, I mean, I've tried to I've tried to tell the story of Welsh language music. Can't get that away. That's not of interest to um, the mm. BBC or Channel Four. It's you know, it's the tastemakers here in, you know, who sit at the top. The commissioners they decide what we're watching and what gets commissioned. Um, and you know, look at BBC Four. That's a, a threat of being closed down now. And all that music programming, all those amazing docs will disappear yeah and yeah, they, they won't be, who who's going to commission them then well sky arts is going free to it isn't it but um yeah. it, it's challenging 
Yeah, that's definitely challenging. Okay, well, here we have another question, actually. What were the biggest challenges making the film and how did you overcome them? Hannah? Uh, just make it, getting the artists and getting the funding we needed. You know, sometimes you have a tiny bit of archive that costs like thousands for a few seconds. Ah, you are very clever. You're like a mind reader of all these questions because Nathan Jennings has said, regarding archive, at what point during production or through the post were these elements gathered together and were they an influential element of moulding the story? Because you have some great stuff. I think particularly um, uh, with Black Sabbath, actually, all those little <laughs> photos of them mucking mm. about on, in the river, like having never yeah. seen a cow before. I mean, it's just fantastic. You have some great stuff in there. And when you start a doc like this, for me, I think, what's the archive? You have to know that you've got enough to tell it. You can't, you probably could tell it on animation, but it's not going to be as good. And so mm. when we first looked and saw these images of Sabbath there, for example, in black and white, they're just amazing, aren't they? And were they, they were owned by Kingsley and Charles or Ozzy no, had them? Or? They're all the, the big kind of places where you license photos. So it's not, I see. Um, yeah. And the smaller places, Hannah. We kind sure. of we trawled in, international archives. Like some of that is from a, a library called Kino, which I think yeah. is in London, but sounds German. Mm. And that you know them going through the woods, playing with the the bow and arrow. Um, I you love know, that. Getty owned own most of the pictures of like Queen and Ozzy, but I mean we've probably all seen them over the years in different places, all dispersed all over, but pulling them all together and then seeing them comprehensively to tell a story makes them a lot more impactful. Yeah, and you John because of the sense of location. John gave us some photos. He, he had those amazing Simple Minds one. And yeah. possibly the roses. No one, no one had ever seen those photos because uh, I'm the only person that's ever seen them. You know, they've been on slides from. We know. should make. We should just make a documentary about your photo albums. Yeah. <laughs> we should. Do that's really important too because people yeah. do give you. The family gave us yeah. lots of photos. You know, uh, all the '90s ones when Anne was working really hard and sitting in the sofa. You know, you you, you need that combination of stuff. Um, some of which costs a lot, and some of which doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a question here from Dog in Blanket. Hello, Dog in Blanket. Um, I, it says, I'm not sure if documentaries of this nature have a writer, in inverted commas, so it might not be a relevant question, but did you ever consider fabricating things for the purpose of this documentary? How much creative license was taken when telling the story? Anna? Uh, no, I would never fabricate anything. It, it's all about what you leave slightly unsaid sometimes. Mm. So that, it's that more than fabricating. You never get to tell every detail of a story. So when we're sitting in the edit in Rupert, we're trying to work out how you can tell these stories with a land. And you, that means often completely brushing over years of stuff. You know, that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. not trying to tell everything. We're not trying to tell every band story. We're trying to tell something that starts to reach out to people and they're listening to people's stories, you know, so yeah. yeah. Um, uh, John, I wanted to ask you something about a quote that you say in the in the film towards the end, which I found almost uh, very moving and summarised the whole thing, which is that the idea that nowadays you can make perfect music. I mean, you know, I can't, but, you know, if I, if I wanted to, I'm sitting in front of a, a, a Mac you, laptop. You, you I could, could kind of, I could, spent, I could, I could, I could record something. You could if you spent a year in Rockfield. If you spent a year in Rockfield. <laughs> I'd come out with a second coming like that. <laughs> All right. Um, but you said that the, that the, the quote that you said that actually a lot of people don't want perfection. You want emotion, you want feeling, you want magic, and particularly you want mystery. And mm. I suppose I just wanted to ask you about that really. Ah. What the mystery and magic? Yes, and, and yes, that, that, uh, yeah. yes, to do with. I suppose it's to do with bands and environment because you have moved between lots of bands, lots of environment, and what yeah. that mystery is, what that essence is. Um, I, you kind of well when 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 I meet a band and they want to make a record first, my first uh, I don't know is instinct impression is what kind of band, what the music is or what kind of band they are or how they are as people and whether they would get on at Rockfield or hate Rockfield, you know, or, or you take them to Abbey Road or you, you know, you take them to a, a cellar in, in Brixton or you decide to do it in France or somewhere, you know, different there's, bands are different. Um, I guess it's just my an instinctive way of, of guessing where the where where to record. I think, um, 
the mystery and the magic yeah <laughs> well i'm all the time i've made music and in fact all the music i'm sure that we appreciate i mean i mean i don't know about 16 or teenagers and things is played by people playing in a space live um, i don't mean a live album but it's there's actually an interaction uh, amongst human beings when they play together um, the amount of feeling on a track is proportional to the number of people playing on the backing track. You know, some bands, they put down the drums first and then put everything on top. I always like, and I think a lot of other, you know, producers do like to get everything down in, in together, you know, the singing and the drums at the same time, you know. Um, yeah. and when you do that, you actually recognize something special about the event that you've recorded, you know. That's Rather it, it's an event. It, it's an event, yeah. It's a magical. That was my favourite line in the film, by the way, John's when he said that. Yeah. It gives me shivers even now, and I knew. Me too. Right near the end of the film, and it sums up Rockfield, and in a way, because of the changes in recording when we made it, we knew we were making. Sort that's of why I think that's why people have a, a heart feeling about the place, the experience of when they recorded there, is because because it creates a, a magic. Uh, that's why the Stone Roses went back because. The, the I'm the Resurrection was a great vibe feeling that just kind of flowed effortlessly almost on that first album. So let's go back and do it again, you know. Um, that's why the, they went back to Rockville, because of the magic that's there, you know, and it's a, the, yeah. the magic of a place, you know. Look, I have two um, lovely questions from the audience here, which I'm going to put to all of you, okay? And um, they're kind of, I'm going to squish them together, all right? Um, and they are this. So one is, what's your, what were your favourite interviews and features from the film and why? But the other one is also, what's your top track from the documentary, including me, actually? So <laughs> I'm going to have a think about that. Mm -hmm. um, but who would like to answer that? You've got your favourite interviews or features and your favourite track. Who wants to start? John, you're rocking. I'm going to go to you. <laughs> I'm trying to think uh, who to... Who to um... <laughs> I'm trying to think of some, some Kingsley interviews because everything he says. One thing I did want to say is that when you work at Rockfield, every evening after dinner, Kingsley comes in the studio and listens and just for a chat and talks, tells you how great Rockfield is, you know, and how great it is and what the cat, what's happening on the farm. But every <laughs> comes in the studio and, and enthuses and digs the music, you know, which means a, a lot, you know. Yeah. Um, so your favourite interview is Kingsley. What about your favourite track? My favourite track? Oh, I, uh, um, I, can't, I can't think of one. <laughs> um, I've got to say something about, about Black Sabbath, really, because I'm just, you know, it's, it's completely out of my repertoire. But at the same time, whenever I hear them or see them, I just think they're so wonderful. And, and a great shame Lemmy's not still with us because Lemmy would yeah. be on this documentary yeah. if Lemmy was He was here. planned to be at the beginning. Yeah. yeah, and he would be amazing. He was still alive when we started it. Was he? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Hannah, what about you? What are your, what's your favourite interviews and your favourite track? I like I, all the big interviews that people probably liked, I, I loved. So there's definitely no favourite interview. But the track that I really like suddenly hearing is Promised You a Miracle. I didn't really know so much the story of Simple Minds mm. in the early days. Uh, I just knew later stuff when I was a kid, the big tracks they had. And yet when they talk about getting there, finally getting their, num their hit, which they needed, and you see him on stage singing Promise You a Miracle in that 80s gear and the joy and everything, I feel that joy. I love that song now. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> um, and uh, Catherine, what about you? My favourite interview, um, uh, Ozzy was fun and we got Ozzy on a really good day. Ozzy's he always was, great. People like, underestimate the Ozzy one. He's the best. <laughs> he was, he was so like, he was just on fire and yeah, and he was really entertaining and, uh, you know, really welcoming to his home. You know, we were there, you know, faffing around in his house and he was, you know, and he was great. I think, I think it's appropriate, but how long? <laughs> it's like a document, how long <laughs> is it? How long is it going on for? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. And I don't think most, most people don't know that was a song made in Wales. No, and it's a great, it's so We started great. this, I didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rupert, what about you? Um, I have to say that um, 
my favourite interview was uh, Simple Minds, only because I, I, I hadn't had any understanding of them before at all. And uh, beyond, I knew Promise You a Miracle, I knew that side of it, but I had not known the stuff that they'd done with John before. And I, I they, um, and I loved that. I mean, they were just, it was gold dust. Their anecdotes were so good. And they were so, so sort of funny and lovely. It's lovely to see Super Super 2, slightly older gentlemen enjoying, you know, rem reminiscing about the past. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that interview. I thought it was just brilliant. And my favourite track was, was their one, the one that they'd done with John there. You know, the one that actually we have in the Amazing. film with their playing, yeah, they're playing in, uh, in New York to Iggy, you know, and I, I, think, I think there's something sort of, because it was a side of their music I'd not even heard. And it was really lovely to have John then talk about how they captured that in Rockfield and leaving the door open down the hallway and just so you get the bass drum sound, sound proper. All of that stuff about, you know, as I say, all the sort of, you know, the sticking plaster kind of mentality, just, like, just make it work in a kind of really interesting way. You'll never repeat it. This is how it is right now. And like John said, this is, that was it. It was captured there and then, and that was the one. And, uh, and yeah, so I love that. I, I think there was something jo joyous about their anecdotes. I love this interview. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, it's, well, oh goodness, we've gone uh, far too long. I would like to say that um, my favorite track was I Am The Resurrection. So there you go, because <laughs> I love that track. And I love the uh, hooray for the <laughs> hooray for the roses finally turning up and doing what they should do. We love them very yeah, yeah. dearly. Um, I'd like to say thank you to um, everyone. Thank you to all the audience for coming along. It's always um, amazing when people come and ask such great questions and listen to um, these fabulous creatives that, we're, that BAFTA get. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for making such a great documentary. I've watched it several times now. I really, really enjoyed it. I found it very moving and wonderful. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, Kat. Thank you, John. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Rupert. Um, everybody go and put your head in a big bucket of water that's cold <laughs> um, and enjoy your evening. See you later. Oh, bye. -bye. bye. bye, -bye. bye.